Welcome to Startup Confidential. What industry insiders will never tell you that you need to know if you're building a consumer brand. With your host, best-selling author of Ramping Your Brand, Dr. James Richardson. Let's do this. Welcome to episode 109. Let's talk about the dirty, nasty P, pricing. There's at least two ways that new CBG founders come to take retail pricing seriously, finally, once and for all. The first way is after their first 3P, distributor payment, which is basically nothing after all those chargebacks and fees. Fees that your product margin in absolute pennies cannot in any way swallow up. If you see on your P&L net pennies per unit of 10 cents or less, I'm sorry, but your wholesale price is way, way, way too low. You failed the primary math test of retail consumer brand. The second way that new founders awaken to pricing problems in their business is, in my experience, a lot more common, but just as bad, only on the other end of the continuum. It's the result of the artisan ego trap to a large extent. And it it tends to happen to pretty smart new founders who do understand the markup math to the shelf and are absolutely terrified of not making money. So much that they incorrectly believe that they should be making a nice profit right away in retail. And so this is how you get lovely folks with great products, for the most part, selling $15 jars of pasta sauce and then wondering why the velocities are crawling all year until after Thanksgiving. Hmm. Ah, yes. The Q4 specialty foods trap. Tis notorious for overpriced early stage brands, folks. I like the ambition of the second group, though, and I admire their desire to run a profitable business. There's nothing wrong with that. It's the timing of when you should expect the profit that needs to be realistic. But there is really something called way too fucking high a price in your category. Yes, there is. There is something called that in your category. Trust me. Many founders who are new to third party or you know mediated distribution to retail get very lost in the markup math on the way to the shelf. I don't blame them because everything thing in your founder being wants to avoid the terrifying sickening truth that the retailer in general takes half of the retail price for themselves oh yes yes they do folks then the distributor takes another 30 percent of that retail price. you the founder make the least of anyone in the value chain off of that sh- suggested retail price yada 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 but wait I'm not here to go over basics. I'm actually here to talk about pricing power. <clears throat> okay, some of my listeners are in finance, so I know I haven't lost everyone yet. Look, pricing power matters because eventually you want this power. It's the power that allows you to command a price increase to keep up with inflation, even if your average retail price is declining because your volume is moving proportionally through down market retailers. Oh my God. <sighs> Starting out, you have no hope of getting a price increase to happen with retailers because you have no volume. You have low velocities and you're nobody. If the distributor doesn't block the price increase, your buyers probably will. The retailer already wants your price lower than it is in most cases, outside of the specialty retail world. The last thing they will do in, say, phase one is let you raise it because you failed the markup online math class. Oops. No one cares. Trust me. Hey, listeners. Exponential growth involves more than a killer product, great fundraising, and a great team. You need superb analytics to ride the ramp. Dr. Richardson's latest online course is now available, Effective Consumer Marketing for Early Stage Founders. You can find course pricing and details at premiumgrowthsolutions.com slash courses. And now back to the episode. The line to replace you is awfully long. And this is why it's, if you're going to make an error, it's much smarter to err on a case price that leads to a very high artisan SRP for sure, because lowering it is actually possible. (laughs) 
at the very beginning. It will take some communications finesse with buyers so that either the distributor or the retailer don't just pocket the extra margin pennies on your new lowercase price. Oh, they will if you're not looking. But farther up the ramp, there is the ability for you to command pricing power. This is one of the great prizes of scale in consumer packaged goods. And you do not find it in every industry. I just want to be really clear. Most consumer packaged goods categories have what they call relatively inelastic demand, kind of like gasoline. And this is very unlike the travel or cruise industry. Whoopsie dingle. In fact, we just went through a mass crazy weird experiment in price inelasticity in CPG due to a substantial double-digit unit price increase trend across the entire industry in 2022. Pricing power, folks, equals the relative inelasticity in your pricing. Price inelasticity means that if your price goes up, the quantity sold doesn't vary much. Just a little. The power of your brand reveals itself in how little your volume changes with a price increase. Now, let me explain this fancy pants concept a little further. Price Elasticity 101 for English and Anthropology majors. Price Elasticity is a very simple formula. Percent change in quantity or volume divided by the percent change in price during the same period. It measures the ability of a category of goods to sustain its current sales quantity, in units, cases, liters, pounds, however you want to measure it, after changes in price, up or down. An inelastic category of goods does not experience large shifts in demand as supply changes. An elastic category using this formula has an elasticity that's greater than one. A perfectly inelastic category, which doesn't really exist, is gonna be close to zero. And honestly, that's kind of where food really is. For example, total food and beverage in Mulo, IRI Mulo, has had a low price elasticity of 0.2 in the past year, according to Spins and and, uh, the nice folks at Whipstitch Capital who shared that data publicly. And this is despite double digit price increases in a lot of brands. This means that owners of iconic mega brands can and do raise pricing dramatically to boost profits. But if they slash their prices, demand won't increase much, which is why they don't do it. For every 10% price decrease, food and beverage demand will increase a mere 2%. Woohoo! If you're in phase one, 2% baseline lift in sales will cause you to cry out in defeat but not necessarily when you're a $14 billion holding company. However, there's significant variability in price elasticity measurement at the brand level. The smaller the the stream of goods that you're measuring, the more chaos there will be in in elasticity. It honestly may be impossible to really measure it well. Just like UPC data from spins is often subject to hallucination when your revenue is low. Well-built premium price brands marketed to the right audience for everyday usage tend to be price inelastic as long as consumers do not think you're interchangeable. And this is where the scope of analysis matters, listeners. We all use gasoline, 100% of it. Gas is not interchangeable as an energy source for personal transport. Not easily. And not for most of us who don't own EVs. It's the same with food. As a category, you will buy it somewhere, you are not a homesteader. When we zoom to the brand level, wow, you become wildly interchangeable, right? Oopsie. Most consumer outcomes like energy, satiety, nutrition, they have hundreds of solutions in the grocery store. In other words, the supply of brands wildly exceeds the demand for your brand. Oops. This is why Liquid Debt focuses almost exclusively on brand identity and can design to be super memorable. Because most water is sold purely on price and people can't even remember the brand they drank two minutes after purchasing it for Wawa. This is why you must build a branded relationship with fans who will pay a very high unit price early on. The pain of the price, the memorability of the brand, and the product experience combined to make things memorable, less interchangeable. Creating an, an irrational burning need for your brand makes the oversupply 
in reality, kind of disappear in the right consumer's mind. And because slashing prices in food and beverage does not grow volume enough when you're a $10 million brand for your P&L to look any different. If you are a $15 billion holding company, a 2% volume increase matters a lot and may allow you to renegotiate your pricing on a core ingredient, which then makes the pricing sacrifice to profit potentially net zero on the net net P&L. This is why major brands have ruthless promo programs to capture that 1% to 2% lift every year. Gotta get it. They got to get me that lift. Easy lift. This kind of lift, however, does not matter if you're a $5 million startup. As I pleaded with readers in, in my book, Ramping Your Brand, the sadly weak volume effect of price promotions for small companies is why you must start selling at 200% above the price of the Oreo in your category, but not much higher or you'll become an artist in specialty game. And once you get to say roughly $100, $150 million, it is time to relax pricing steadily over years to obtain your 2 to 5% annual built-in boosts of volume. Hmm, now that compounds pretty nicely, actually, like a bond. Reducing price should be done at the SRP level slowly over years after hitting 100 million, after you've built a powerful, memorable, not very interchangeable brand, and not through promos. Pricing power, folks, in sum, cuts both ways in CPG. You can price relatively high if you are not interchangeable. But slashing your price, no matter how cool you are, is not how you scale. That's all I've got, folks. Be safe out there. Thanks for listening. Remember, Dr. Richardson has loads of resources for founders at premiumgrowthsolutions.com. And when you're on his site, don't forget to take his founder's quiz and see if you're ready to ride the skate ramp of exponential growth.